Good afternoon. I'm Andy Talkov, Senior Director for Curatorial Affairs at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And welcome to Curators at Home, a weekly series where we uncover the real stories and real people behind Virginia's history. The museum may be closed for now, but we're still here for you to enrich your lives by preserving and sharing the story of Virginia. If you haven't already seen what we have to offer, go to virginiahistory.org slash at home to enjoy a curated selection of free digital resources, including podcasts, webinars, virtual tours, and hours of recorded lectures. None of the work we do would be possible without the generous support of our members. Unlike some museums, we do not receive state operating support, and it's through private donations that we're able to preserve and share Virginia's story and offer programs like this. As I prepared for today's program, I thought a lot about being 16 years old and sitting on the floor of my living room watching America's Most Wanted with my mother. I can still hear the slight rasp of John Walsh's voice, the soulless gaze of the suspects in their mugshots, and the campy but really creepy reenactments of the crime and the escape of those responsible. I tried to understand how people could do such terrible things to one another. And many nights, I'll admit, I lay awake afraid that one of the fugitives would break into our house, murder my family, and use it as a hideout. I was so relieved when I heard that on a later episode, they announced that that particular fugitive had been brought to justice. And to this day, my mom and I find true crime shows to be at the same time disturbing but that the voices of the narrators and the formulaic storytelling can be comforting. True crime stories were popular long before the late 1980s and for centuries have been read in print, broadcast over the radio, portrayed on film and streamed as podcast. There has always been an element of sensationalism that accompanies the reporting of crime stories, which in turn inspire based on true story adaptations, which can make separating truth from fiction rather difficult. But while searching through the collection of the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, I came across the facsimile of a small watch key belonging to attorney Charles Meredith. And this small item led to my own discovery of a crime involving sex, murder, and a sensational trial that captured the attention of Virginians and the nation. This is that story. On a cold, damp morning in March 1885, Lysander Rose, caretaker of Richmond's own old reservoir, shown here circled in red, walked briskly up its southeastern staircase to the top of the 20-foot embankment that stood like a fort over western Richmond. Just like every other morning, he made a circuit of the reservoir by walking along the levee surrounding the 50-year-old lake that had provided drinking water to the city. As he rounded the southern end of the reservoir, shown here, he saw a broken shoestring, a woman's red glove, and footprints in the muddy pathway. Looking across the water, he saw a floating log. Or was that the edge of a woman's dress and a leg jutting up from the water? By the time the coroner arrived, women had dragged a woman's body to shore. And since there was no decomposition, it was clear she hadn't been in the water for long. There was some slight bruising on her face and a tear in her gown at the elbow. It was likely obvious to all that the less than five foot tall young woman was with child. And a later autopsy revealed that she was eight months pregnant. The, uh, the coroner suggested that she had foaming in her lungs and her death was soon declared. The tragedy was reported in the city's newspapers the next day and headlines such as this one from the Richmond Dispatch, a woman's watery grave, waywardness or foul play drew a great deal of attention. Ah! 
During the next two days, hundreds of Richmonders visited the chapel of the city's almshouse, shown here, in an effort to try to identify the body. And at least twice, people identified the body as a missing loved one, only to have those people found alive and well. But on March 17th, a young woman positively identified the victim as her cousin, 23-year-old Fanny Lillian Madison. The oldest of eight children of Charles and Lucy Madison of King William County, Lillian had a strained, some evidence suggests abusive relationship with her family. She also had a colorful past. Part of her trouble was the result of a larger family conflict between the Madisons and her, and her mother's family of Tunstalls, Walkers, and Cluviers. Lillian spent part of her youth at the home of her great aunt, Jane Tunstall. Tunstall had been widowed and used her significant means to support the education of her nieces and nephews. Lillian lived with her for a while when she went to public school, and Tunstall paid for a year's tuition at a private academy. Convinced that Tunstall was poisoning Lillian against them, her parents rejected her offer to pay for a second year of school. But Lillian also attracted some of her own controversy. In 1800, when she was 18 years old, a well digger named G. Bailey Biggs exposed a number of indiscreet letters that passed between himself and Lillian and three other local men. In one of the letters, she revealed her plans to move in with one of them when she went to visit the state fair in Richmond. This publicly embarrassing uh, episode uh, was eventually resolved and Biggs left the county. Lillian in turn burned all of the correspondence. And two weeks after she turned 21, Lillian left home to live with her uncle John Walker in King and Queen County. When she realized that she was pregnant in the fall of 1884, she left the neighborhood of her youth and took a position with the Dickinson family in Bath County to teach their adopted son and a few other children. Likely, this was an attempt to hide her pregnancy from her family. Several people who knew Lillian in Bath County described her as depressed, which wasn't surprising, considering she was soon to be an unwed mother in a society where such things were taboo. And before coming to Richmond in March 1885, she burned her correspondence and reportedly remarked to a friend that something horrible was going to happen to her and she didn't want her mother to read them. On her way to Richmond, a train porter noted that she said to him that she hoped the engine would run off the tracks and kill her. He dismissed this as a joke, but two days later, she was pulled from the reservoir. Since the time her body had been found, Richmond detectives discovered considerable new evidence. On her arrival to Richmond, Lillian checked into the American Hotel under the name of Fanny Merton. A canvas bag filled with women's clothing marked F. Madison was pulled from the banks of the James River the day her body had been discovered. And a woman's hat was apparently thrown through the window of the dead house at the smallpox cemetery adjacent to the reservoir. A red shawl was found in a yard near the road leading to the reservoir, and both of those items were identified as having been worn by Lillian. Together, these clues strongly suggested that Lillian Madison had been murdered. Five days after Lillian's body was discovered, detectives arrested this man, 24-year-old Thomas Judson Cluviers at the King and Queen, a county home of his aunt, Jane Tunstall. You heard that right. The same Jane Tunstall who funded Lillian's schooling until her parents forbade it. Thomas Cluviers was Lillian's second cousin. Cluviers didn't fit the profile of a cold-blooded killer. Like Lillian, he was born on a small farm in King and Queen County, but unlike the Madison's large family, Thomas grew up with only one sibling. The Claviers were far less reluctant to take help from Jane Tunstall, and both Thomas and William went to live with her in 1876, 
where she ensured that the two men received a good education. In 1880, Thomas started at Richmond College, now the University of Richmond, and two years later graduated with a bachelor's degree in law. His acquaintances held him in high regard. And after college, he returned to King and Queen County, practiced law, and was a well-known and respected member of the community. He even served as assistant superintendent of the Sunday School at Olivet Baptist Church. What made this story so riveting was that unlike Lillian's, the final chapter of Thomas's life had not yet been written, and the whole story was humming with uncertainty. Historian Michael Trotty suggests that the case became so sensationalized because white Southerners, two white Southerners, Clavier's was, was not an outsider. He was one of their own. And if this man was a monster, how could they discriminate between him and themselves? The month-long trial of Thomas Cluviers began on May 13, 1885, and was held in the Hustings Court in the temporary Richmond City Hall, which as you can see here, was located on the block between Capitol Square to the south and Broad Street to the north. In this image, you can see the building that had been the temporary City Hall, the building marked Home Office Life Insurance Company of Virginia. During the trial, dozens of witnesses were brought to testify for both the prosecution, led by Charles Meredith, and the defense. Throughout, Claviers maintained his innocence, and although he had been in the city jail in, in the city at the same time, he denied having seen Lillian on the day of her murder. Nearly an entire day of the trial focused on a weekend in late August of 1884, surprise eight months before Lillian's death, when both she and Claviers were staying in the house of their uncle, John Walker. Witnesses testified to the dates the two were there, the layout of the house, and the plausibility that Claviers quietly left his room to meet Lillian in her room at the middle of the night at the other end of the house. Two of the most damaging eyewitness accounts to Clavier's case were given by members of the community whose opinions would have been little regarded by genteel white society in the 19th century. Mary Curtis testified that Clavier's had visited her at a, a house of bad repute where she was working as a prostitute numerous times since he had been uh, in college and claimed that on the day of the murder, she saw the couple together in a bedroom located in the back of a Richmond cigar store. While she was able to identify Cluviers by sight, she could only describe Lillian as being heavily veiled and, and wearing a dark colored dress. The only distinguishing feature was her red shawl, an article of clothing that a number of witnesses used as proof that it was indeed Lillian with Claviers and not some other woman. One of the most detailed accounts of the couple's activities came from William Tyler, an African-American night watchman at the American Hotel, which you can see here circled in the upper right, which was located at 12th and Main Street. Here you can see uh, an image of the American Hotel uh, from a, a period uh, uh, engraving. According to Tyler, Cluviers visited the hotel and asked to see the woman in room 19, the very room that Lillian was staying in under the name Fanny Merton. When told that the lady was not in, Cluviers asked that a note be passed to her, reading, I will be there as soon as possible, so do not wait for me. Oh, so do wait for me. The note never reached Lillian, but was torn up and discarded only to be later reassembled by hotel employees and entered as evidence. A streetcar driver, Thomas Williams, testified that he picked up a young man wearing a light overcoat, slouch hat, and carrying a satchel uh, and accompanied by a, a lady at the American Hotel, again shown just south of Capitol Square, circled in red. They got off at the corner of Main and Reservoir Street, located 
uh, in the upper circle at the left side of the screen, where which is in the center of what is today uh, VCU's campus. And then another witness, Dr. Thomas Stratton, was walking behind a couple on Reservoir Street when the man turned very quickly, asked to confirm that that was Reservoir Street, and then continued on his way when Stratton um, you know, turned onto Cary Street, the intersection which is shown in the lower red circle there. Cloviers and an unidentified woman continued south on Reservoir Street toward the Marshall Reservoir, which you can see at the lower left of this, of this image. Two key pieces of evidence submitted uh, at the trial were a foul poem found in Lillian's trunk in Bath County written in Clavier's hand. The poem, which was called On the Delaware, was so filthy even by today's standards that the newspapers at the time wouldn't reprint it. The other piece of evidence was the watch key found at the reservoir. This is a facsimile belonging to the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. But the original, along with trial testimony, photographs, and other pieces of evidence, are in the collection of the Library of Virginia. When police arrested Cloviers, they noticed that a key was missing from his watch chain. And later, a jeweler in Centerville said that he had repaired a watch key for, for Cloviers a year earlier that matched this exact description. One of the African-American workers at the American Hotel testified that he saw the key in Lillian's room, although that's questionable. But at trial, numerous family members, colleagues, and other witnesses identified this unique key. While Thomas was under trial and the public hungered to know everything about him, it's interesting to note that the major parts of Lillian's history never appeared in court or in print and were not the subject of investigation by the press. The prosecuting attorneys obviously avoided delving deeply into matters that would sully her reputation. And only once during the month-long trial did the defense pursue a witness to testify against Lillian's character. As they probed into the 1880 episode with Well Digger Biggs, they also presented statements by two men who had exchanged love letters with Lillian in Bath County. But even though one of those men could have been Lillian's, uh, the father of Lillian's child, it seemed to have no effect. Throughout the child, uh, trial and appeals, Thomas Cleveres professed his innocence, and a growing number of Virginians came to his support. The question about whether he did or didn't murder Lillian was divisive. And Cloviers claimed to the end that he did not see Madison during the night or day of March 13th, even though the two had been in the city at the same time. On the night of June 4th, Charles Meredith closed the case for the prosecution and the journey retired to deliberate. 40 minutes later, at 9.30 p.m., they returned and declared Thomas Judson Cloviers guilty of the murder of Fanny Lillian Madison. When asked to comment, Cloviers remarked, I would say, sir, that you will pronounce sentence on an innocent man. That is all I have to say. The judge sentenced him to be hanged on November 20, 1885. A number of appeals upheld the original sentence, and Clavier's supporters flooded the state legislature and the governor with letters to intercede. And even though the governor changed the date of the execution, there was no clemency offered by New Year's Day, 1886, or 1887. For nearly two years, Cloviers was held at the Richmond City Jail, shown here in red, and in this image, where Interstate 95 runs through the site. The night before his execution, Cloviers continued to hope for a stay from the governor. The best tenor in the city came to his jail cell to sing a rendition of Home Sweet Home, 
but got so choked up that Claviers actually finished the song for him. Claviers then slept for a few hours and woke to have a hearty breakfast. Shortly after noon, word came that the governor would not intercede. Now, executions were not supposed to be public spectacle, but because of the amphitheater-like topography of Shaco Bottom, thousands of people witnessed the hanging of Thomas Claviers from the streets and rooftops facing the backyard of the jail shown here where the scaffold had been erected. A great roar went out from the crowd when he was brought outside into the winter sunshine of Shaco Valley. Mounting the scaffold, Clavier said few words other than to his spiritual advisor. The method of execution was soundly criticized in the press, particularly the use of a gaudy red, white, and blue silk rope that unfortunately did not break Clavier's neck when the trap door opened on the gallows but stretched like a bungee cord as he slowly strangled to death. A deputy mounted the scaffold and pulled Claviers up a few feet as he thrashed about because his feet were practically touching the ground. At 1.08 p.m., Claviers was pronounced dead, the last person to be hanged in Virginia history. Claviers crime was described in national newspapers like in this Columbus uh, Ohio Daily Inquirer as an act as dark as any that can be found in all the calendar of crimes. And the Dallas Morning News wrote on the uh, day uh, of the execution, look well this morn, Cluviers, upon the ridge of the sun, for by St. Paul this glance shall be thy last. Today, Fanny Lillian Madison is interred in a family plot in Richmond's Oakwood Cemetery next to the body of her unborn son. This faded stone gives no hint to her violent death or to the trial that attracted the attention of a nation. This large magnolia tree marks the spot where Thomas Claviers is buried in the Tunstall Family Cemetery in King and Queen County. Speculation as to the guilt of Thomas Claviers and interest in the story of his relationship with Lillian Madison did not die the day that he was hanged at the Richmond City Jail. The subject has been uh, included in a 2011 novel by John Milliken Thompson entitled The Reservoir, a novel, and was included, as mentioned earlier, in Michael uh, Ayers Trotty's 2008 book, The Body in the Reservoir, Murder and Sensationalism in the South. The story is also well told as part of Brian Burns's Gilded Age Richmond, Gaiety, Greed, and Lost Cause Mania. Brian spoke about his book as part of our Banner Lecture series in November 2017, and you can find that video on our website. So the questions still remain. Was Thomas Claviers the father of Lillian's unborn son? Did Lillian come to Richmond in hopes of terminating her pregnancy? Did Thomas lure her to Richmond with the intent to murder her in order to save his reputation? Did the Commonwealth execute an innocent man or a monster? Had the crime occurred today, we may have had the means to provide some answers but the historical record may never reveal the truth, but we'll keep searching, questioning, and speculating, which is what makes true crime stories as alluring today as they were more than 100 years ago. So if you have any questions or comments about today's program, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and be sure to join us next Friday, June 5th at noon, when Dr. Karen Sherry, Museums Collections Curator, will present Virginia stories of the Underground Railroad. Until then, thanks again for watching and be safe.